Cherubs, this is Tintern Abbey. It's one of a number of monasteries dissolved during the reign of Henry VIII between 1536 and 1541. Before that, the English and Welsh landscape was rich with these spaces. They were, with all their songs, prayers, and books, an integral part of the landscape and culture. It's been said that nowhere in England could you be more than a 30-minute walk from a monastery like this. Since they occupied so much land, about a third of the land in England, to be clear, and on that scale, they provided a lot of employment, and they also provided a lot of education. Now remember, this is before universal public education. In fact, one could easily argue that the destruction of these monasteries set back the education of women in England by a couple hundred years. Source in the description below. The impact of these structures, though, went far beyond practical purposes like employment and education. Their primary function was prayer, and through this prayer they served as a contact point between heaven and earth. They connected the fabric of England to the divine, and in the 15th century that is a practical purpose, so I'm sorry if I implied that it wasn't. The monasteries also kept books and relics. Unless you were one of the elite and able to attend university, these institutions were your best hope of learning how to read or to find a book. The relics that they held attracted tourists from all over and stimulated local economies. Back then, tourists were called pilgrims. So basically, they were responsible for education, employment, and tourism, and the very salvation of one's community. They were pretty important places. But they had their problems too. All that land these monasteries occupied technically belonged to the church, which was headquartered in Rome. So the revenue that they generated had to be filtered through Rome. Henry VIII's decision for England to leave the Catholic Church in 1534 wasn't just symbolic, it was also a land grab. He felt that the state of England, him, could manage that land better. There were other problems too. Those libraries really only had religious books. The education that they provided was really only religious education. The employment structures that they used were often corrupt, inefficient, or both. And finally, those relics that had attracted those tourists, they were often fabricated. They weren't real. Monasteries claimed to have stuff like milk from the Virgin Mary's breast, which is both a strange claim and a false one. So when Henry VIII's agents dissolved these monasteries and took off the roofs, they confiscated and destroyed the relics along with a whole bunch of religious art. The destruction of religious structures like this has a special name in art history, iconoclasm. And that's what I want to talk about in this video the relationship between art and faith. The Protestant Reformation, which took place in Europe during the reign of Henry VIII, provoked waves of iconoclasm. Statues were broken and the walls were whitewashed. The belief system behind this, the belief that religious art has a pernicious effect on the viewer, was not new or exclusive to Protestants. Other Abrahamic religions like Judaism and Islam both do not permit representational art. Both will cite the story of Moses and the golden calf as proof of art's negative impact on faith. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he found his brother Aaron and the Israelites worshipping a golden calf instead of God, which was unfortunate because one of those commandments said there shouldn't be any graven images worshipped above the divinity. So they got in trouble. With God. That's bad. But Christianity has always been different in that regard. There is a rich tradition of representational Christian art. One of the defining authors of the Christian doctrine, Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, is rumored to have also been a painter, and one of his subjects was none other than the Virgin Mary. So if Luke can do it, why can't I? Why can't Raphael? Additionally, there's the story of Christ carrying his cross and being given a cloth to wipe his face with. When the cloth was returned to the woman who provided it, she found Christ's face had been imprinted there. We don't know the name of this woman who gave the cloth to Jesus, so Christians have ever since referred to her as the saint of the true image, or in Latin, Vero Icona. Veronica. She's, she's Saint Veronica. The point is, she had a picture of Jesus, and that's cool, so representational art is cool. The general philosophy in Catholicism is that representational art of Jesus or Mary is fine, not only because of Luke and Veronica, but because people can tell the difference between representation and reality. No one will try to cut down a picture of a tree thinking it will provide firewood, so nobody will pray to a painting of Jesus and mistake the painting for being Jesus. We're smarter than that. But that's not really true. We may like to think people know the difference between representation and the thing represented, but there are notable examples of when this failed to be the case. 
Take, for example, the story of a painting printed in a work from 1476. In the story, Pope Boniface VIII oversees the reconstruction and redecoration of the old Basilica of St. John Lateran in Rome. His artists follow their instructions and then take initiative to fill in some blank spaces with a portrait of St. Francis and a portrait of St. Anthony. Boniface accepts the portrait of St. Francis, but orders St. Anthony be removed. But then, the story goes that the workers sent to remove it were driven away by a terrible, gigantic spirit and couldn't perform the task. Boniface conceded, Let St. Anthony alone, he said, since we can see he wants to stay. Clearly, this painting was treated as though it was St. Anthony and not a simple representation of St. Anthony. And this wasn't some uneducated guy living on the edge of civilization. This was the Pope. So Protestants like John Calvin, who preached iconoclasm, have their reasons. The representation of God or Mary or the communion of saints could be worshipped instead of the concept of the divine they were intended to represent, especially in the years before the Protestant Reformation. I mean, I've been guilty of worshipping Michelangelo. But this worship of the representation in place of the divine is the golden calf story all over again. So there were two factions. The Catholics, who continued to believe in the positive elements of representational art, outweighed the negative, and the Protestants, who saw representational art as extremely dangerous. Art communicates through the senses, and so ultimately this is a question of whether or not our senses can be leveraged to build religious knowledge and faith, or if they're just a distraction from true faith which doesn't require the senses. Different religions deal with this question differently. If we leave the Abrahamic religions for a second, we can look at Tibetan Buddhism for further insight. In that tradition, the practitioners believe that the full scope of the human experience, including sense perception, can be leveraged to enlightenment. Think of it like this. Have you ever felt spiritually connected to a song? Have you ever entered a space and been stopped suddenly by the power of the architecture? Seen a sunset that forced you to be silent for a second? danced so wildly that you seem to lose yourself in a moment? Well, some religious traditions think those kinds of spiritual moments can be a path to understanding something greater than yourself. In fact, Catholicism doubled down on that approach in the years following the Reformation with Baroque art, which clearly emphasizes the role of sensory perception. Spaces like these are intended to leverage your senses and to inspire a religious experience. So let's return to the ruins of Tintern Abbey. They remain, I'll bet in ruins, and remind us of a time when these once great structures represented a connection between heaven and earth. The physical presence of this structure, the chanting, the singing, they all lifted this space up to commune with the divine. The sensory experience of these activities connected England to heaven, and now the stones slowly return to nature. So we have to return to that question. What is the relationship of art to faith? Can physical senses be manipulated through art to inspire faith in something greater than ourselves, or are they a distraction? There are a lot of similarities between the art world and the religious world. Indeed, it's difficult to name an artistic medium that doesn't have its origins in religious ritual. And when you enter a museum or a religious structure, there is a similar reverence for the space a certain quiet, but also a certain expectation of meaning. We have a built-in assumption in these spaces that the objects we see have an intention or meaning beyond their physical reality. Like, take those relics I discussed earlier, for example. Real or not, they had power. They could elevate the perceptor's religious imagination. We all have objects that have an unreasonable significance or sentimental value to us on a personal level. Those relics had that, but at a communal or shared level. And that's real. That feeling isn't fake, even if the story surrounding the object is. Art consistently does that as well. It can lift an everyday object up and inject it with significance. Think of Duchamp's ready-mades, or Louis Nevelson's sculptures from salvaged wood. The ruins of Tintern Abbey no longer sit in the tradition of Christianity. No one sees Tintern Abbey as a link to the heavens anymore. But we are certainly awed by it, and walking in these ruins does connect us to something. Our past, maybe, our instinctual love of the aesthetic form, our relationship to time, our relationship to nature, I have no idea. But I know this space has significance greater than the stones that compose it. I know that I'm having a spiritual moment here. And it's not just me. These ruins have inspired poetry. If you've ever heard of Tintern Abbey before this video, it's most likely because you read the poem by William Wordsworth in your English class. They also inspired artists like J.M.W. Turner or Elizabeth Hay, and numerous others as well. These monasteries once held religious art, objects with a theatrical purpose, objects beyond objecthood, 
that spectators projected meaning onto. Churches, monasteries, and other religious buildings around the world still do that, but today we also have art museums that fulfill a similar role. So I'm still left wondering what that relationship between art and faith is. Is it an aid or a distraction? Are art galleries religious spaces? Have they replaced religious spaces? I don't know, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. These days I'm putting out a new video on about the 15th of every month. I also have a Patreon link in the doobly-doo below if you feel so inspired. And as always, thanks for watching.